If you use any of these slides, we just ask if there's a photo credit or a, a science credit that you just use that. So we are all about um, trying to shift everybody, right? So it's not about um, we need to profit off of this by any means, which we're almost operating like a non-for-profit anyway, <laughs> but, but the planet's the one who's going to profit off of this. So this slide is Autumn Blum. She is the founder of this company. She's a cosmetic chemist. When she sold her last company, she went diving in Palau, as any good entrepreneur would. She was, uh, she's a, a technical diver. She's a rebreather diver. So she was at her safety stop and she watched about 60 people jump off of a boat and was so impressed with the rainbow slick that came off. And then went, wait a minute, what is that rainbow slick, right? What are, what are we looking at? So the first product that she made was actually to deal with that situation. It was a shampoo designed for people to use on the dive boat because most of that shampoo goes right over the water, right? You're on the, the back step and you're, you're shampooing off. The first product she made was whole food certified, eco certified and organic. Whole Foods loved it. They ordered 250,000 bottles. What a great way to start a company. She didn't sleep well that night. So instead of filling that purchase order, she sent it off to her alma mater, Eckerd College in Florida there, and asked them um, anything they, she knew that they had a science lab and anything that they had grown in the lab. Put it in an aquarium and put a couple drops of this shampoo in and let me know what happens. Two drops in a 20 gallon aquarium killed everything within two hours. So this was a shampoo that was eco-certified, whole food certified, organic. None of those things mean anything for the aquatic environment. There's very little information out there about the aquatic environment. So that is what ended up being the launching point for our whole company. Now everything has to pass that same test. We haven't done those tests in a lot of years because we now know what works, which is a good thing because I think in Virginia and California, we wouldn't be able to sell it because they now consider that same sort of test um, being the, the cruelty-free sort of thing. But there's no reason ever to test on mammals, no reason to test on anything in the la in, on the land because we have all the, chemi the chemistry and biology samples that we need in labs. That is not the case with the aquatic environment. It is a very, very different place. So luckily, the, you know, 30 some odd species that we killed in that 20 gallon aquarium saved 250,000 bottles from getting out there, right? And really, that's the idea behind all of this. That's me. I was raised in Hawaii. I do almost every water sport. I do them all poorly with the exception maybe of racing uh, Hobie cats, outrigger canoes, and I've been a whitewater guide for a lot of years now that I live in Idaho. I, brought, I was brought up in Hanama Bay in Hawaii, and I watched the reef completely change. I went there every week. Uh, my uncle was a researcher for the University of Hawaii. When I was a child, you couldn't walk into Hanama Bay without getting run into by fish. There were so many. When I took my daughters back about 12 years ago, my precocious oldest one said, amazing bay, beautiful hike to get here, but I've been in the water for 10 minutes and I haven't seen a fish. Why did we bring our mask and snorkel, right? And that had gone from, you were getting run into by them. My little anecdote that I tell people is, um, when tourists showed up that were not taking care of the reef, the locals would put frozen peas into their swimming trunks because then those 15 pound fish would join them in their swimming trunks. And that got them out of the water really quickly. Usually it was because somebody was standing on the reef. This is actually a photo taken a couple years back on Molasses Reef in um, Key Largo in Florida. And now it's even degraded to the point where you can't tell that it was coral. It's just kind of a mound of rock at this point. So we know that we're not the only thing that's causing these problems, but what's interesting about it is all of the problems are connected, right? So according to Dr. Swan, Dr. Swan studies petrochemicals. So she studies plastic, she studies what it does to the ocean and what it does to humans. This is gonna be a little bit sketchy here, folks, so be, be braced, right? So she has a specific date. She says the year 2050, that sounds like it's forever right? I mean, for somebody who graduated in 1986, 2050 sounds like it's forever, 28 years. 
she says that by 2050, because of the amount of plastic and the petrochemicals in the water, 2.4 billion people on the planet will actually starve because there will be more pieces of plastic in the ocean than fish. And because all of these petrochemicals are actually estrogen and endocrine disruptors, it's hard for the fish to be able to breed. So if you go to places like Hanama Bay, Hanama Bay has so many sunscreen chemicals in there at any given moment that the fish and the moray eels, like the wrasse, the parrotfish that start out female and one needs to convert to male during breeding time to be able to continue the species, there's too much estrogen in the water. So they cannot make the conversion. There is a parrotfish in Hanama Bay that has been trying to convert for three years. And parrotfish being rather large, the females are white, kind of red and brown, kind of muted colors. And the males are like peacocks, right? Beautiful turquoise colors. Uh, it's really obvious when they're making the transition because they're kind of half and half. This poor fish could only get about halfway. The same date, based on the fact that we have lost 60% of our fertility in the last 22 years, right? The human species lost 60% of our fertility. Based on that fact, she says, if we continue on this trajectory, by the year 2050, we will actually be functionally extinct as a species. So you look right now, um, it's a full quarter of the population of the United States that when they try to get pregnant needs to have medical intervention. At this point, one third of the males being born are actually being born with a micro penis. It is all about the estrogen that's in both parent systems when they go to actually reproduce. So if you want to scare people, that's a good way. If you use the wrong sunscreen or the wrong shampoo, that's what's going to happen. Usually at this point, if I'm in a dive shop, somebody says, I'm going to go home and slap my parents, but they need to have that little, that little break of levity during that, that, uh, <laughs> that little portion of the speech. So NOAA estimates 14,000 tons of sunscreen enter the reef. NOAA is only talking about the people that are literally walking into the water with sunscreen on. They are not talking about this part, which is sewage, right? So all of it gets into the water. Within 30 minutes of applying the wrong sunscreen, the wrong shampoo, the wrong conditioner, turns out 82% of all the body care products on our planet contain estrogen and endocrine disruptors. About 30% of them are turning out to contain carcinogens. Within 30 minutes of application, they can test your urine and your estrogen, your endocrine disruptors, and your carcinogens are way too high for humans. And the FDA acknowledges that this is the case. So if you shower, if you urinate, it's getting out to the ocean eventually. So I usually in the past used to dance around these sort of subjects. And I had an intern for NOAA and NASA. Anytime they were doing an ocean experiment in space, she was the go-between. And she said, Mike, the deal is that the ocean is 70% of the oxygen for the planet and between 30 and 50% of the carbon sequestration. If people don't understand that the reef is the nursery for the ocean and that's how human life continues, then you have to talk to them about their junk because that's important to them. And she said, the reason is, look at the National Hockey League. The National Hockey League had the cup as a mandatory part of the uniform 100 years before the helmet. You can Google that. If that's what people are interested in, then we better talk about it, right? So if we're gonna save the ocean by being playing the fool a little bit, I'm in. Color me clown, I'm fine with that. Oxybenzone octanoxate are the two chemicals that were banned in Hawaii. Unfortunately, what that did is it opened up the whole chemical foundation to come up with new chemicals. So they traded oxybenzone for avobenzone. Any chemists in the house? Benzone, benzone, right? Oxybenzone, avobenzone, right? There's a little bit of a difference. One drop of oxybenzone in six and a half Olympic sized swimming pools is enough to kill coral larva. That gets you to 62 parts per trillion. So people talk about dilution's the solution. No, it's not, right? 62 parts per trillion is one drop. 
in Hanama Bay prior to COVID. 6,000 tourists a day were getting into Hanama Bay. It was sitting at 29,800 parts per trillion. If you walk into the water, your estrogen levels change within a couple of minutes, right? And the fish cannot breed. And the coral hasn't bred there for a long time. It's all dead. The benefit of avobenzone is it takes two drops. Cool. It's also estrogen and an endocrine disruptor. And here's the part that's going to really tick people off. It's an obesinogen. Go ahead, Google that word. It's hard to spell. It tells your body to store fat. So when you put it on your skin, within 15 minutes, your body is beginning to store fat. And then because it's a toxin, the body stores it in your subcutaneous fat. And the body's really smart. And it says, there's a toxin stored in your subcutaneous fat. So it does not want you to lose that fat because then it's exposed to that toxin again. So this chemical actually tells you to get fat and stay fat. I wanted to do a thing with a lip balm that said, does my lip balm make me look fat? And that got vetoed. I was also trying to figure out how to do, you can tell I'm a little bit off color in my, so please don't take any offense. I was trying to figure out how to do a politically correct, um, we support transgender fish, but I couldn't figure out how to do that PC, but it's very, very disheartening to me. So when you have them on your system, uh, in your system, on your skin, it goes into your urine within 30 minutes and it bioaccumulates. So if you use the same shampoo three times in a week, you have the equivalent of an estrogen birth control pill, low dose estrogen birth control pill, and you will have that for two weeks. I had a 16 year old boy at the DEMA dive show ask me if he still needed to use birth control if he had on sunscreen. That's why I like talking to 15 year old girls instead of boys, <laughs> but, but it was an interesting conversation. A lot of people don't know what the endocrine system is, so I've thrown it up there um, and you can go through that very easy to Google. It turns out that BPA perfumes, fertilizers and UV filters are all petrochemicals and many of them are exactly the same ones. And that's what's in 82% of our body care products. So perfume. That's a really big one. Fragrance. That's a really big one. We're going to have a, a test on that at some point. We're also going to have a test on the 62 parts per trillion. Remember that 62 parts per trillion. Most important is the parts per trillion part. We're going to have a math question at some point. Oxybenzone and avobenzone now um, get into breast milk. We're finding it in newborns just like we're finding microplastics in newborns. Um, it's associated with uh, endometriosis. There's all sorts of links to breast cancer. There's all sorts of links to all sorts of estrogen positive diseases. If I were a woman, I would be very upset that they are marketing all of these products to me and they are not making the cure on the pharmaceutical side. Um, when they first came up with oxybenzone and avobenzone, the sunscreen company, the body care company that told us that we had to wear it in 1954, you can study all of these things, their parent company started testing infertility and erectile dysfunction drugs because they knew that it was going to do harm and people were going to respond if they wanted to have children and if they couldn't get an erection. They didn't come up with endometriosis drugs or how to stop early menstruation or painful menstruation. That's why I think I would be really pissed if I was a woman. Hirschsprung's disease, the one down at the bottom is actually when babies are born without a colon and it's a huge amount. So back to the company told us in 1954 to wear sunscreen, the chemical was patented by Monsanto. Their parent company is Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Monsanto created an herbicide that blocked the sun from getting to the plant. So the plant died. Then some brilliant scientists said, what happens if we put it into plastic bottles? Will it keep it from degrading? Yep, it will, so they did. When we put it into a shampoo, will it keep it from getting UV damage and rotting too fast? Yep, it will, so they used it. Will it stop humans from getting sunburn? Sure, let's throw it on humans. We've been using it since 1954 and it has been approved as an herbicide. It has never been approved as something to put on humans. That's not actually something that the FDA does. 
They don't approve stuff. They will tell you that minerals are the only ones that are generally regarded as safe and effective and that no chemical sunscreens are. So does a little estrogen matter? Yeah, you add it to zebrafish, you get more females. If you add more and androgen, you get more males. What does it do to the reef? It deforms them, it kills the larva, feminizes male fish, increases coral bleaching. Actually, I don't know if anybody saw, there was a CBS news report that was really interesting that showed that if there was algae, it did less damage. And if there wasn't algae, it was more damage. And it did get underneath the skin of the coral, just like it goes underneath the skin of humans. If you read the sunscreen descriptors, it says that it's the sun's energy is absorbed underneath the human skin, and then it just dissipates. Once again, any scientists out there, does it sound like energy actually just dissipates? It never does that. It has to have a byproduct. So the byproduct of it is heat. So if you add more heat to coral, of course, that's going to increase the bleaching. And then what they determined is it actually creates free radicals, exposing the coral to so many more diseases. That hasn't been proved in humans yet, but I'm kind of betting that that's the direction that it goes. The skeletal system is the endocrine system of coral. So when you add an endocrine disruptor, that's the sort of problem that you have. What's the effect on mammals? Toxic to sperm development, blocks testosterone in your urine within 30 minutes. Um, in, nine, let's see, 2008, they said 96.8% of Americans. It's now over 99% of Americans have this in our system at all times. And it takes about two weeks to get it out. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the pod of whales uh, in the San Juan Islands in Washington. I actually did some research on Orcas Island with the pod of orcas that are up there. The firstborn, they're an amazing pod. If you study them, the environmentalists have all said that there's enough natural resources to support a pod of 500 whales. The whales, is, the family has never gotten above 103. So they actually like regulate their own population. That's amazing, right? We know nothing about these, these creatures. When one gets sick, another one would get pregnant. The firstborn of every mother whale would die as soon as it started breastfeeding because all of the toxins from the mother went into the baby whale. About a year and a half ago, that pod of whales was pushing a dead baby around for about two weeks. They'd never done that before. What happened? The researchers told me that that was the second born whale of that mom. Her chemicals are accumulating so much faster now that that was a second born of that mother and the pod was not willing to accept that. So they kept pushing it around, trying to get it to breathe. How heart-wrenching, right? And those are what sentient beings to know that, yeah, this isn't supposed to happen. So we're gonna try to make it work. So let's look. How serious are we about that 62 parts per trillion? This is Maui, right? You can go around to all the beaches where people swim and you can see what the parts per trillion are. Most of the places, it's not going to breed coral. Uh, some of the places where it's a zero, it's either a really windy or a currenty area or huge surf. Or if you go to Hana, I don't know if anybody's ever taken the road to Hana, but it's super curvy and everybody's got car sickness by the time they get to the end. You've spent many hours you get down to Hana and there's not much there. So you turn around to head back to your, <laughs> your hotel or wherever you're staying, right? Get back to the other side before it gets dark so you're not on this windy road. So of course, there's not many parts per trillion there at all. And most of the people that go swimming there are actually uh, Hawaiians or people with dark skin. Octanoxate was the other chemical. Um, it, once they figured out that it, uh, oxybenzone was the number one Allergen in 2014, uh, they decided we needed to have octanoxate, but you can see the, the numbers there. So get ready for the math problem. And Heather, I see there's a couple of chats. I don't know if you've checked those or we need to respond to those. Just making sure that somebody's not freaking out because we went all negative, because I'll throw a positive in there at some point if you need it. I think we're okay. <laughs> oh, <wait a> <laughs> just, just making sure. I, I want everybody to be happy, healthy, and productive here. Okay. There's Trunk Bay in the U.S. Virgin Islands. There's our math problem. What went wrong? Can anybody find it? Nobody ever has. So don't feel bad if you don't. 
Remember, it was 62 parts per trillion. St. John Trunk Bay is in the top 10 most beautiful beaches on most magazines and most top 10 lists and things like that. When I was there, I was unwilling to get in the water. It looked like somebody responded to the chat, so maybe they have the answer. I was unwilling to get into the water because I know that my estrogen levels will be changed within a couple minutes. I'm 53. I'm trying to keep all my parts in the right place and, you know, looking male and all of that fun stuff. So we went around that island way in the back. And unfortunately, there was no coral alive there either. There were no reef fish. There were rocks. We saw a couple of turtles. That's fabulous. Turtles don't really care whether the reef is alive there because they're eating mostly, you know, algae and seagrass and all that sort of stuff. It was very disappointing. The next day, we voided our warranty on our rental Jeep and did a little bit of off-roading through some really deep puddles and got to a bay where there was a mooring buoy, but there was no boat there and there were no humans. There were no houses. There were no tourists. There was hardly any way to get there without a really long hike or a four-wheel drive. It looked like Hawaii 50 years ago. It was amazing. There were tons of different types of coral, different fish. I mean, it... It was like Hawaii 50 years ago. And that was all based on the fact that there wasn't the human impact that, that was there. Did anybody figure out the math problem? We have two answers. Well, Michael Sen said it's trillion now billion in this picture. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, okay, hey. awesome. It went to billions. So give that man a prize. <laughs> um, you are welcome to go in and choose any of our products from their, <laughs> from their shop. Um, and you're the first person, I have done this talk hundreds of times, and you're the first person to see that it was billions. Maybe it's the prize motivation. Maybe <laughs> I need to have that. Um, so yeah, it went exponential. It's parts per billion. And this is the same sort of situation. In Hawaii, the Pacific Ocean is never Pacific, right? It's very, very rough. And so you get more water exchange. Down here in the Caribbean, there's not a lot of water exchange. And when we were there, we watched people get off the cruise ship, hop on the ferry, come over to Trunk Bay, and they were averaging about 6,000 people a day when the cruise ships were in. And it wasn't enough time for it to, to break down and, and not be toxic anymore. It's really sad because they have a cool um, kind of a snorkeling trail there where they have all these little signs underwater and you can, you can watch them. It would be great if there was some coral alive. This is closer to home. You've got all the different chemicals in there. The one that scares me is actually all the way down towards the bottom. Pabas, for one. Pabas have been banned in the U.S. for almost two decades. Um, that's when that used to be the little uh, tanned girl whose bikini bottoms were being pulled down by a puppy. I, what is that, copper tone or banana boat or something like that? That's when they used to use pabas, when that was still an appropriate ad. Um, the other one is this octocrylene. Octocrylene is in 13,000 products that are on the market today. Octocrylene, when you put it in a tube, you put it on the shelf within a couple of months, it degrades and reacts with the other stuff that's in the bottle. And it turns into benzophenone, which has been banned in the US for 25 years because it is such a harsh carcinogen. It was only run in Bloomberg report one time, okay? Back in December, the Bloomberg report was the only press that picked it up. The FDA acknowledged it and said, yes, it's true. All of that happens and it is a carcinogen and it is in your urine within 30 minutes and it's way too high for humans and it's a very big risk. And we're going to wait a year to see what the manufacturers do to fix the problem. What that says to me is 13,000 different product names, labels, types is trillions of dollars worth of inventory. And they're not willing to do the recall for that. We're the guinea pigs. And that scares the heck out of me. We have tons of these sort of photos where there's a healthy coral on the top, a bleach coral on the bottom. Essentially, it's going to look like the next slide where it says 100 parts per billion of this or that or whatever, this many hours. The end result is typically that it ends up bleached. The one in the middle is interesting because it was a beautiful big brain coral. It was a boat full of volunteers that were doing coral research. One of them said, I have a prescription sunscreen because I need something that's hypoallergenic. 
Well, the boat supplied stream to sea sunscreen because most of the people that know sunscreen know that stream to sea is the only one on the planet that's actually tested not to cause this problem. And it is dermatologist approved, pediatrician approved, hypoallergenic, all that fun stuff. This gal, it was what you uh, divers like to call a sporty day, which I would call a barf cruise, but that's all right. She didn't want her tank to hit this brain coral, so she lightly pushed off. We know that it had oxybenzone in it, it had octanoxate in it, it had homosalate in it, it had octosalisate in it. It was bleached the next week. When they came back, there's her handprint. About a year and a half later, the edge of that beautiful big brain coral started to bleach all the way around. At the two-year mark, it went completely over, and now it's just a mound of dust. So you can see where it used to be, but it's not there anymore. And that was from a one-second touch. Like I said, here's more of the same sort of thing. We can tell you what that top aerosol sunscreen was and all that sort of stuff. This is what happens when you put sunscreen or body care, because they're the same chemicals, you just can't see it on the label. And that's a really important distinction with a over-the-counter drug. Sunscreen is an over-the-counter drug. If you have it in an over-the-counter drug, it has to be on the label. If you have a shampoo, a conditioner, a lotion, a hand soap, a makeup, anything that you put on your body that's a body care, it's regulated completely differently than an over-the-counter drug. If you have that term fragrance or parfum, Everybody says, watch out for synthetic fragrances, but they never tell you what that means or what you're supposed to be worried about. I'm going to tell you, 3,000 chemicals can be hidden under the term fragrance in a body care. You have no idea what you're being exposed to. About 600 of them are estrogen. About 600 of them are endocrine disruptors. So in body care products, you don't want anything that says fragrance. If you spray an aerosol sunscreen while you're standing on grass, doesn't it sound like I need to be James Earl Jones? Sunscreen, footprints of death. I don't know, that's not me. I didn't come up with that, Melina Fagan did. But it is an herbicide, remember? So if you spray it on grass, you come back the next day and you can see your footprints, everything else around it is dead. When you spray that sunscreen, like the manufacturer says, 18% sticks to your skin. The rest of it goes airborne and goes 450 square meters from wherever you sprayed it. If you have ever smelled it, it changed your hormones. If you've ever tasted it, it changed your, you know when it's on your tongue? Come on, everybody's had to experience that at some point with the aerosol. And this is actually in Maui on a very, very calm day. It went 450 square meters. Now here's one of these things. I know there's lies, damn lies and statistics, right? I'm not gonna pull the wool over your eyes. This is the Marine Bird Preserve that's about a half a mile away from where they were testing that aerosol sunscreen. And there's the chemicals in all of the bird eggs. So every single bird was born with all of those chemicals in their system. Now look at that type of bird. I'm sure that it was eating crabs and fish and all sorts of stuff. And that's likely where it was getting some of the amounts too. If you anybody wants to study turtle eggs, I'm sure we could find the same thing. It's about a $25,000 study. But this is a study that they did on fish. This is the muscles of the fish, and this is all the chemicals that we're ingesting. Dr. Craig Downs from Hereticus Lab says if you eat fish three times a week, you have an estrogen birth control pill in your system, right? Three times a week. We do have these ingredients to avoid carbs. Once again, you have this problem. All of those chemicals can be hidden under the term fragrance in your body care. But if you ever want to look for sunscreens, you can figure out what's on there. Now there's a brand new one that's very unfortunate that is not on this card yet because we've just learned about it. It's a chemical that's being banned in the UK, but it's not acknowledged in the US as a sunscreen chemical by the FDA. So it doesn't have to be under active ingredients. So some of the really clean reef safe sunscreens are using a chemical called butyl octosalicylate. Go ahead, somebody try to spell that one. Butyl octosalicylate is actually an aspirin derivative. If you read aspirin, it says not safe for pregnant women will cause birth defects. The reason that a mineral sunscreen would put a chemical in there is because A, nobody in the US knows that it's a chemical. Nobody knows that it's dangerous. Its whole job as an aspirin is to make the skin not turn red. So a sunscreen that would be an SPF 35 or an SPF 40 is now an SPF 50 because the way they test for SPF is if the skin colors. So this falsely 
keeps the skin from changing color. You still get burned, you still get skin damage, and you're now exposed to a toxic chemical. So obviously we don't use those either. Why would people use a chemical sunscreen? Because it can say organic. That's one of the biggest reasons at a natural health you know, food store or something like that. The chemicals can be organic. A mineral in and of itself is inorganic, so it shouldn't be an organic thing. It goes on smooth, it's like a lotion, it gets rubbed into your skin. All of those things now you know cause a problem, but that's what people have been sold, that we're supposed to, it's supposed to do that. It's also supposed to smell great. All of those things make your eyes sting like crazy if you get it in them. Why a mineral or what mineral? So here's a really important distinction. Any of the chemicals, if you look at an active ingredient and there's a chemical, throw it out. If you see butyl octal salicylate under inactive ingredients, throw it out. The next best would be something that said titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. What's really important about that is you didn't hear non-nano. If it doesn't say non-nano, it's a nanoparticle. And nanoparticles are small enough to get into fish eggs, get into, you know, causing disruption for coral larvae and all sorts of things like that. And zinc. Zinc is slightly water soluble. And as it breaks down, it changes the pH in the water. It's fine for humans, but it changes the pH in the water. So it causes birth defects and sea urchins and you can't, coral can't breed and all that sort of stuff. But these are things that are becoming, being called reef safe because it's a mineral. So if you look at a nanoparticle sunscreen that goes on beautifully and you know you just paid 60 bucks for from some fancy company, on the shipping label, which does not come to you on the bottle, but on the shipping label for those nanoparticles of either titanium or zinc, it shows a picture of a dead piece of coral and a dead fish. And it says highly toxic to the aquatic environment. And we call that reef safe. When you get a non-nano, right? So there's the list, right? Chemicals, awful. Nanoparticles, still pretty awful, but exponentially better than the chemicals. The next best would be a zinc oxide that was a non-nano. Still slightly water soluble, still changes the pH, still has that label with a dead piece of coral, but still much better than the nanoparticles. And then the next step would be a pure titanium dioxide that's coated or an eco-safe zinc that is coated. And at that point, there's just us. Stream to see is the only one that does both those things. If you have not put on a mineral sunscreen, because I saw somebody in the chat say, I have used a crappy white one. Cool, I'm with you. That's, I don't like the white one myself at all. What I do like about the white is you can put it into your eyes and you can eat it. It's not gonna do any harm. It tastes awful, I don't recommend it. It's kind of like chalk. It looks like it would be going on raspberries or something and it's really not. Um, we are the guinea pigs for our products. So know that we know that they're really safe. Um, you just use a very little bit. Our new everyday mineral sunscreen, you can put it on however you want and it's gonna blend with almost every skin tone and cause absolutely no problems. Here's another marketing thing that's very important. We've been sold a bill of goods. We've been told you have to have SPF 50 or higher. Understand that my grandfather died of malignant melanoma. I am not taking you know, skin care lightly at all, but this is the facts. SPF 30 blocks 97% and SPF 100 is 99. It's actually about 1.6% difference. So why do we care? right? We've been sold that it has to be that way. Why? Because all of the money comes from the pharmaceutical companies to go to the skin cancer companies to go to the chemical companies that make the SPFs above 50. It's very hard to get a mineral sunscreen at SPF 50 or higher without it looking like house paint, that crappy white one that people said. And I see the chats growing. I hope one of you are paying attention to it if I need to respond. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can actually look at our YouTube channel. It was a test where somebody took three different aquariums, put a competitor sunscreen in one stream to see in another in a control group to develop aquatic toxicity, to determine that something has aquatic toxicity. Everything needs to die in 96 hours, a hundred percent kill rate in 96 hours. In 96 hours, three of the competitor sunscreen died. 
30% attrition rate in fish is just fine with the EPA. They don't mind. I think if 30% of the dogs died or kids or something like that, we'd be up in arms. But fish, yeah, they die. But none of them died in the stream to sea. We've seen this now four or five different science experiments, and I don't have the $250,000 in five years to determine that stream to sea actually makes the environment better. But that's what I keep seeing experiment after experiment. When they put sunflower seeds with the competitor sunscreen, they didn't even sprout. And the stream to sea ones grew 50% larger than the control group. With brine shrimp, the competitor sunscreen killed them almost instantly. The stream to sea group actually lived longer than the control group and long enough to breed. So what's going on? I think it's all the antioxidants. But if you watch this, it's horrendous. The stream to sea group is on the left. The chemical sunscreen is on the right. Within a couple of hours, they stop moving. People that work on large fishing vessels where they use live bait, they know if you reach your hand into a bait well with sunscreen, two thirds of the motility of the fish go down within a couple of moments. The bummer is at 72 hours and 96 hours, more of them started moving again. It's actually them going into rigor mortis and their neurological systems being fried. So they're twitching and they're running into the side of the tank. It's awful to watch. But by two weeks, everything in that tank is dead. And it's because they can't handle those chemicals. And here's shampoo and feeding behavior. They never eat again when exposed to it. So what you need to understand is stream to sea is a very, very difficult, difficult, it's that too, different type of company. Autumn founded it eight years ago and has not taken a salary yet. I started working with her six years ago. I haven't taken a salary yet. It's because we need to change this trajectory. And every time we turn around, we find something that is not safe. So almost two years ago, um, Autumn came to me and said, hey, we can be our lowest paid employees. We can each get about a $20,000 salary. And I went, woohoo, we're, you know, living large. This is going to be great. And then a week later, she said, okay, I just learned something. And I went, uh-oh, what's wrong now? She said, I've seen tests on mass defog. If your spit doesn't work, the number one thing that people use is baby shampoo. And even the commercial brands are usually a base of a baby shampoo or something very similar. She said, I've seen tests on close to two dozen baby shampoos and all of them are 100% kill rate in an aquarium. And we're putting them on babies, okay? So I know that we dilute it and we don't use very much, but two drops is enough to kill everything in a 20 gallon aquarium. So instead of our lovely $20,000 salaries, we made a mass depot. <laughs> so it's out there. It's also very important that everything settles. So the beauty of a titanium dioxide is it's very heavy. And so it sinks really quickly. All the chemicals and the nanoparticles create a suspension in the water. I've found that this is very difficult for coral, but I recently learned from somebody in Delaware that horseshoe crabs are kind of important little beasts. Horseshoe crabs like to hang out in Delaware where the tourists like to hang out because they're nice, low sloping sandy beaches. She said that they're having a problem in Delaware because I don't know you I don't know if you've heard the NPR or the TED talk about what they use horseshoe crabs for. They harvest 30,000 of them a year, pull a third of their blood out, it's blue, and they inject it into vats of medicine. So anytime you've taken a liquid medication and it says on it shellfish allergy, it's the blue blood of a horseshoe crab. If it clumps, that's something that would have killed humans. If it settles to the bottom, then that vat is safe. So they ship it off. Unfortunately, a third of those crabs die. And now what they're having trouble with is all the suspension in the water is allowing their eggs to float into shore or out to sea. So they're not breeding as fast as they used to. So there's actually, I had somebody on this um, a training just like this about six weeks ago that knew the name of the bird. They have a bird that goes through that area and now it turns left at Delaware before or right. I don't know where they're going south or north or where they're going, but stops there to gorge themselves on the eggs of the horseshoe crabs. She has tested 115 different brands that say reef safe on them. And to date, the only one that allows the horseshoe crab to breed unimpeded is stream to sea. You're probably all used to hand sanitizers 
Most of them are very toxic. Watch for triclosan and carbomer. Carbomer is a microplastic that they make it in, that is kind of a gel. Triclosan is an endocrine disruptor and estrogen mimicker. Um, a lot of them have parabens. A lot of them, you can actually find oxybenzone, avobenzone, octocrylene, all these different things in it to keep the UV from, from harming anything. I've got all sorts of stats on the hand sanitizer and we don't need to go through that. Just suffice it to say, you can actually make one that's pretty decent for humans in the environment and it still kills all the germs faster than the, the CDC requires. So that's kind of cool. We mix it with um, chamomile and eucalyptus, which actually is very good for novo viruses. Any place we can, we do test or make a difference. This is the Protect Land and Sea certification. There are only five brands to date that have been able to pass this. The first time 115 brands tried five years ago and everyone failed, including us. Stream to Sea failed this. But they came back to us and they said, you're 300 times cleaner than anything else we tested. Find out where you're getting cross-contamination. What's happening? We went through our whole supply chain. First, we bought a factory because we realized that our lip balms were not passing our um, aquatic toxicity tests. So we had to have our own factory so there wasn't any cross-contaminants. And then we had to go back and control our supply chain because at one point in Snaith, England, I don't know where Snaith, England is. I've never read Harry Potter, but it sounds like Harry Potter and evil and fog and some sort of dragon in Snaith, England. And it was evil for us because they were storing one of our ingredients in a blue plastic tub. The blue plastic tub was leaching all of these chemicals on the Protect Land and Sea into our product. We had to change what they store everything in so that they would not leach anything into our product. So still to date, there's only five that have passed this. One of them's a nanoparticle. All the rest of them are zinc. One of them is actually a diaper rash cream and it's really clean for humans, but it goes on like a diaper rash cream. If you've ever used it, that's like spackle. It's like spackle mixed with glue. Do you want that on your skin? I guess for babies, it's, a, it's an important thing. But yeah, still to date, there's only five. And next year, according to Dr. Craig Downs, if they don't change their formulations, it will only be two. It'll be us and the diaper rash cream. We talked about our SPF 20. We know that these are in uh, sugarcane resin tubes. If we have the option, we will use a sugarcane resin tube and you can put it directly into your eyeballs. I used to wear contacts when I went to trade shows and I can't anymore because I have to put it into my eyes the whole time because people don't believe me. SPF 20, of course, would be my favorite because it's only a couple percentage points different than an SPF 50, so who cares? It's less chalk and it's less grease to move the chalk around, so it spreads more nicely. It does show up wherever I have five o'clock shadow starting at around noon or in my arm hairs or anything like that, you are going to get slightly zombie-esque. That's just how it is. In Hawaii, white is the new green as far as they're concerned. Put it on and you, everybody knows that you're trying to protect the reef. SPF 30 is going to be exactly the same thing with a little more chalk. I prefer the tinted. If you use the tinted well, it doesn't show up anywhere, but I am not vain or I'm slightly lame. Like every time I go to the store, I put the reusable bags on the bottom and then put all my groceries on top. Same thing with this. I own a sunscreen company and I tend to rub the tint just all over my face. And then it does a weird dye job on my white goatee. And everybody looks at me like, what is going on there? I may learn one day. I think I'm just going to start using our everyday mineral sunscreen because it doesn't show up. But this stuff is amazing for that. To give you an idea, the first time we went to Fiji, we used an organic sunscreen because I didn't work for this company and I didn't know. And I thought organic meant something good in body care. It doesn't. It means that there's more chemical potential. But we took seven bottles of a super expensive organic brand. And in 10 days, um, well, actually in seven days, we went through all of it and then had to purchase a $125 bottle Fijian, uh, which still is about... 65 bucks of awful stuff. The next time we went back with our family of four, I brought four three ounce bottles of this tinted sunscreen. My family of four went through one and a quarter in 10 days. It does not take very much. And wear a rash guard, right? And a hat. I mean, let's, let's not be silly. It's cheaper, right? Why not? And it's safe. I don't have new slides for our new lip balms, but we now have three 
new flavors of sunscreen lip balm. We have three new flavors of our hydrate lip balm. Anybody that's addicted to lip balm, it's usually about a quarter of the population. The part when you put it on your lips and you go, ah, oh, that feels so good. It's cooling. That's actually making you addicted. It's drying your lips out, right? So what I love about our hydrate is I used to put it on um, two to three times an hour and I'm down to two to three times a day. I don't even have one in my pocket right now. Um, and I think if I got counseling, I would stop because my lips are healed or electroshock therapy. I don't know. I take a lot to make change. Leave-in conditioners are number one repurchased item. Anybody who has curly hair and gets into the salt water, this takes all the salt out. If you need to go from the dive boat to a business meeting or out to lunch, whatever, the salt sticks to your hair and then sticks to your clothing. And every time you move, it pulls and it drives you crazy. I don't have a lot of hair on the top of my head. So I put some conditioner on there and then rub the rest on my body. It's like you just took a shower. It's amazing. If you are a free diver, free divers have a tendency to use um, body lotion and conditioner to get into their wetsuits. I was actually talking to an individual at DEMA that is in charge of a free diving organization. I said, tell me the products that you use for that. And he showed me and I looked all the chemicals up and everything. And then I went back about a half an hour later and I said, I know we don't know each other real well, but tell me if you're experiencing any health issues. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, let me see if this resonates with you. The average age of male hormone replacement in the last 21 years has gone from 62 years old down to 38 years old. And he went white. He said, I just started testosterone treatment six weeks ago. He said, why are you asking these questions? I said, because you just told me that you sit in your wetsuit for seven to eight hours with a lotion and a conditioner that's full of estrogen. Right? That's what I wanted to know. We're up to 19. Are people freaking out? Okay. As long as you, you just warned me, I don't want anybody to freak out on me. The conditioning shampoo and body wash is designed specifically to be used in freshwater, saltwater. That term biodegradable, all of our stuff says reef safe and biodegradable. We are completely changing the definition for what that means. The definition of biodegradable in a body care product is it will break down in sewage sludge in 30 days in a wastewater treatment plant. It does not mean that it's non-toxic. It does not mean that it will break down in freshwater, saltwater, dirt, or air. It means that it will break down in a wastewater treatment plant to the point where the FDA is okay with us drinking it. All of those chemicals that we've talked about are water soluble. They go right through a wastewater treatment plant. So it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Ours is non-toxic from the word go. It doesn't harm any of the aquatic life. And then we know exactly how long it takes to break down in freshwater and saltwater. We had to pay the lab differently because they've never done those tests. So we were approached by a group that wanted us to sell their sailors soap or something like that designed to be used off the back of a boat. They had a 30 day biodegradability study and they had some of the most toxic stuff I'd ever seen. Now, we're obviously not partnering with them. The Sun and Sting Gel is so cool. Autumn is an amazing scientist and because she can stay underwater forever, she tries to get certain fish that she finds to pose. She was at the 40 minute mark and this little booger would not pose for the picture that she wanted and she brushed into fire coral. That changes your perspective on the world. So she said, I'm, I'm out, right, I'm leaving. The indigenous dive master said, wait, 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 went underneath a brain coral, pulled some snotty stuff out and rubbed it on her arm. Counted to 10. At 10, she didn't feel it. She, when we bought a building together, it had one of those um, instant hot water things. And it looked like it had like a flame on it and whatever. And she pushed it. And when I wonder if it's hot and stuck her finger in, I'm like, what kind of chemist are you? You're supposed to like, you know, waft it towards you. You're not supposed to pick, you know, don't taste it. You know, that sort of thing. The next day she had to test it. So she went and rubbed up against the same piece of fire coral and then couldn't find the brain coral. Took her 35 minutes and she was blistering and in serious pain. But once she found it and put it on, it cured everything quickly. So we go harvest all the brain corals we can find so we get that snotty stuff. No, we found the enzymes that are in there 
and we put that in there. So it's very similar to some land-based enzymes, but when you put that in there, it is amazing for bug bites, for jellyfish, for Portuguese man of war, for fire coral, anything that bugs your skin, you can use it as aftershave, uh, obviously for sunburns or normal burns. Um, kids roll down a grassy hill and they're irritated. You put that on fire ants, any of those sort of things. It's just absolutely amazing for that. And then we have a nourishing body lotion. We also have now a prebiotic hand cream. We have a squalene. Squalene and the prebiotic hand cream within two weeks of use, 19% of your body's own microbiome returns. Squalene is something that's usually shark livers and it's usually something that's really expensive in a very small bottle that people like uh, Kim Kardashian would use for about 200 bucks. Um, stream to sea doesn't roll that way. We want everybody to be able to use it. So I think it's 1895 and it's actually made out of an olive leaf extract. So we're the first shark free certified by shark allies on the planet. We talk about sustainable packaging. If we can't get sugarcane resin, then we use a post-consumer recycled. And it's really important. We never really hammered this out. There's no mutually agreed upon term for reef safe or reef friendly. Somebody asked me about that today. I hear everybody's going to reef friendly. That's just marketing. It's just subterfuge. None of it means anything. There's actually a prosecutor in Sonoma County, California that is suing brands for false advertising. So all she has to do is find one of those chemicals in there and she's suing them. She sued a brand named Reef Safe and then Blue Lizard. And now she's going after all the botanicals, which is huge, right? That's the Haines Celestial brand. That's, that's gonna be interesting to see what happens. They just came out with a new one that's their biodegradable Hawaii safe line. And it's all the chemicals on our ingredients to avoid. How sad. So Stream to Sea is the only mineral sunscreen and body care product on the planet that's been tested and proven not to harm humans, freshwater fish, saltwater fish, C. elegans, and coral larvae. The reason that we throw C. elegans in there is because they share 94% of human DNA. We think we're really cool and we're 6% different than a sea worm, right? Or nudibranch. <laughs> They're prettier than we are, but, and they haven't caused a whole lot of problems for the planet. But yeah, we think we're much cooler than they are and we're not that much different. So if anybody's gonna ever test on stuff, they're kind of the canary in the coal mine. And then the last slide is something that I'm sure one of my graphics people made for me because they know that I used to race Hobie cats and, I want to live in Fiji and one day it might happen. Okay. Did we learn anything? I would love questions. If somebody has a really good question, you're gonna get something as a door price too. Go. We do have a question that came in on the chat uh, from Jen. Let me see if I can go back and find it. After arming ourselves with knowledge, is there a safe way to dispose of bad sunscreens we may find in our households? Beautiful question, I love it. They are going to look at you very funny when you do it. You need to take all of your body care products that you have, or at least 82% of them, or you have to